Hey there, comic friends and fiends, or should I say, barbecue friends and fiends? It's Rob here in front of the Great Wall of Comics with this little intro to this little video here. So I've been asked a lot of times to do something about barbecue because I do, uh, one of my big passions aside from comic books is barbecue. So I did this video. Now, without thinking, because I don't normally record from my phone, the first segment, because I recorded various segments, which will be edited together here uh, throughout the cook, is uh, I unfortunately had my phone in the vertical mode. So I apologize to you for the vertical small screen nature of the first segment. Rest assured, I learned from my mistake after I saw it, and the rest of the video is uh, in landscape mode with a big uh, picture. So I apologize for that. Uh, I'm just an amateur. Anyways, I hope you enjoy this. Uh, happy to talk to you guys about barbecue anytime uh, out at the cons or when we're out and about. But uh, I know we're really here about comics. But just don't read. Don't just don't eat your barbecue and read your comics at the same time. Barbecue sauce. That's no bueno. Hey there, comic friends and fiends, it's Rob. And I'm not in front of the Great Wall of Comics, but I'm here with a big piece of meat. And some of you might be wondering, Rob, why are you sitting there with a big piece of meat? Because she's that lucky. But, no, because some of you guys have get, know that I do barbecue as well, and some of you have requested that I do something with some barbecue. So, here we go. This will be one that's video that's completely different than all the rest. We do some barbecue stuff. What we're going to do today, uh, we're going to work on here over the next actually day or so. Uh, this video will be compiled. Uh, this is, is a brisket. This is a uh, 10 pound, or just over a 10 pound brisket. So it's a smaller one, which is great because it's all, we're not having a huge cookout this go around. Uh, it is a prime grade brisket, which is what you're uh, ideally, if you're just going to the store and getting a brisket for cooking for your friends and everything. That's what you're going to want to look for is a prime grade brisket. It's got a good amount that has to do with the amount of marbling and fat content that's inside the meat. Uh, a choice is going to be leaner and not going to necessarily be as good. Look at this. This is actually coming right off already. Um, <clears throat> so prime grade is great. You're going to hear a lot of stuff. People talk about Wagyu. Wagyu is great if you're doing competitions. But really for your personal stuff, I mean, yeah, you can do it. It's great. Um, but I personally think it's a little bit overkill. It's a lot of expense. Uh, especially if you're learning, but once you, even once you get it, uh, if you do barbecue right, uh, an expensive cut of meat is um, not necessary. But good quality meat is always necessary. So uh, one of the first things that we that I like to do with the brisket, once we got it unpacked here, is we just want to, first of all, it, most of these are usually cryo or vacuum packed, um, so they're going to be in there, they're going to have a lot of blood on them. Just after we've drained it, we're going to go ahead and lot some of that up so that way while we're handling it it's a little bit easier i like to have uh, some foil down to keep my countertop uh, clean and the glove up because well that's just a habit i've kind of gotten into as i've done competitions and whatnot now depending upon who you listen to uh barbecue people have a lot of different opinions and there's a lot of people who are going to tell you Great, you got your brisket, season it, throw it out there on the smoker, and go to town. You don't want to trim the fat because the fat is flavor, and then it's going to render down during the cooking process. Well, that's true to an extent. Uh, however, remember, we're going to be cooking this at a low temperature for an extended period of time, and while we do want fat there to help to render down and help keep the meat moist, especially down here at the flat where it's thinner versus here at the point where it's much thicker and much fattier, especially where two different muscles kind of come together. And we could separate them out. And I do do that sometimes at competition with a larger piece of meat, but with a thinner piece of meat, there's really no need to separate the muscles. We'll keep it together for this cook. But what's gonna happen is you're gonna see, I'm going to go in here and start cutting. If you were to feel right in here, this is a huge piece of fat. This is about two in, inch and a half thick. That is not going to render down. It's just going to be a big glob of fat that when you cut that and serve it to your fr friends and family, they're going to be all, ooh, this disgusting. Also, your seasoning is not going to penetrate this. 
So you can season the heck out of this and all you've done is put a bunch of flavor on the fat that no one's going to eat. So we're going to go ahead and trim this down. Uh, this is nice, this piece already come here. So I'm going to go and start, get a nice sharp bony knife and I'm going to go ahead and start going. Now it doesn't have to be precise enough to be pretty. We'll start taking off some of this, oh, flying fat. You can just kind of feel where it goes. And you can see, you know, there's a good chunk off, but it's solid. You can see how solid fat that is in there. And you'll see, I'll take another big pass of this off. There's just no way that that's gonna melt down during the cook process. Now, what you can do, and I do like to do with some of these bigger pieces like this, is I will hold on to them. Uh, not because I'm gonna make my own soap or candles or something, but because, uh, as I mentioned before, the flat end is thinner. And once we get to a certain stage in the cook process, I'll lay these on top of it like this to help keep this moist while it's cooking. Uh, eventually I'll have to take it off so I can get my bark to develop there. But it's a, it's a little trick that I picked up in a way to help to uh, smooth out the cook process. Um, so I'm just gonna come in through here and I'm not doing, a, this isn't a competition, so I don't need to do a super pretty trim job, but I do wanna peel this back to get this silver skin. I'd like to get this membrane out of here because that membrane is gonna prevent the penetration of the seasoning into the meat. So being able to cut that back and get to the meat underneath there is gonna be a benefit to us here in our process. So I may fast forward through some of this so if all of a sudden my knife works starts um, picking up at high speed, it's not because I'm a Ginsu ninja, but just because I've decided to fast forward for the sake of making you guys not watch 12 minutes of me trimming meat. Although some people might want to watch me play with meat for that long. But that's a different story. That's a different show. Mm -hmm. So it's nice, if you have a really sharp knife, once you get this going like this, you can see, I can just grab, I can have a piece and just be pulling on it. And as I'm pulling on it, it's just enough, the blade can get just right there and I can go flush along the meat. And it's gonna, that fibers and the silver skin and everything, so it's gonna pull it right up. So I can get right underneath it really easy, flaying it. But the key is you have to have a good quality, sharp knife. If you have a dull knife, you're just gonna be unhappy. unhappy. All right, so from this side, I don't wanna get too much into there because that'll take that away unless I wanna, uh, I don't, actually I might trim that, actually that whole edge is just fat. Let me just take this corner off. Yeah, this is almost no, there's almost no meat there, so there's no point in that. So just we just trim that, trim that edge off completely. And that's fine. I said well, feeding four people with this 10 pound brisket will be fine, even with leftovers. All right, so I can feel here. Now here's where you wanna be careful. If you start feeling, yeah, this is still super thick. And I can come in here and I can continue to sit there and carve away at it to some degree. But if you, but it, go, it will, this is where the muscles, this piece of fat actually go transverses through there and it's actually what separates the muscles. So if you go carving away forever, you're gonna end up separating the, the, the muscles. And in this case, I don't wanna do that. So I'm just gonna go ahead and trim back that edge. So that's pretty good through and through here. Let me get a little bit of this here just so I can get some seasoning here. All right, let's flip this over. And again, now again, this is what we're gonna, this is, you can see there's so much, we have this fat cap. Again, if I put seasoning on here, nothing's gonna happen. In some spots, this is pretty thin, but in other spots, this is actually rather thick. So it becomes a game, again, of just kind of feeling with your knife 
and looking where things are going. So you can see how thick that is in through here to get your meat. Now, if you have a good piece of meat that's well marbled throughout, then it, having this on the top isn't necessarily as important because the meat is going to get a lot of its muscle from inside, and I want to get my seasoning um, down in there. And again, my family does not like to have tons of fat in their slices of brisket. That Now again, this is the spot where this is all comes down to your personal preference. There's a lot of people out there right now who are watching this, maybe do their own, that are like cringing up a storm that I trim this much back. Um, and that's your choice on what you want to do and how you want to do it. Um, I, when I first started, I was of the school of don't trim it, it's flavor. And I didn't realize until I started going into this really how you just don't need a quarter inch thick fat to get that flavor in there. We just need some. And for me, this has worked much better when I'm doing these cooks, either for uh, family or for competitions. Because all this fat is just not only gonna block your flavor from getting your, your seasoning, it's also going to do the same thing with your smoke. Your smoke is not going to penetrate. Here, here again, we're kind of coming back to the side that's got the two different muscles. So you gotta be careful also in here, if you're trying to keep those together, where you're cutting and being cognizant of where those muscles connect so that we keep them together. Because right here, this is actually the line right here where this is starting to uh, be a separate the separate muscles that got this will this muscle here is sliding back underneath this muscle here and It's also where you'll notice if you can I don't know if you can necessarily see it here But over here this muscle you can see the grain of them is going this way over here We have the grain of the muscles going this way. It's because it's the two different muscles this has become an issue when it's time to slice this because we want to make sure we slice the brisket across the grain. So when we're getting to here, this portion here, we can do these ends. But when we get to here, we've got to set, we start to tend to separate and rotate so that way we can cr cut cross grain. If you don't cut across the grain, you end up with super chewy meat and you're sitting there trying to figure out why it is that your meat you just smoked for 16 to 18 hours has got this awful, awful pull on it and isn't just falling apart like you expect it to. The nice thing about barbecue, I tend to find when you're doing this type of stuff, this is very much like our comics, guys. Uh, everybody, you know, there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's really subjective, up to you on what you like, from everything from flavor profiles to the wood you use, uh, to uh, how whether or not you choose to trim or not, how much you trim, that all really kind of comes down to your personal preference um, and you as an individual. Now, having said that, if you tell me you're gonna go cook this over mesquite, you and I, we're gonna fight and we can't be friends because mesquite is crap wood, and that's just my opinion. But as a fat man with fat sack of comics, I have fat opinions, as we've discussed many times. Uh, and it extends over to barbecue. All right, this is really thin, this piece of meat now over here, so we'll definitely end up taking some of that extra fat there. This is fine, so here you can see these muscles where they're fine. 
So I don't want to go cutting into there and carving into there. Um, I'm going to trim just a little bit more off this edge because this is all a lot of fat here. Um, as you can see, always with the stuff in these nice sharp knives, do be careful. Um, you know, they're designed to cut meat, and guess what your fingers are. Some people will suggest, and maybe I should have done this, um, if you, one of the things you have to be, when I'm doing this, this starts to warm up, it gets really kind of um, more difficult than when it's firm. Some people will pause, or even before they start, they'll actually throw it in the freezer and uh, let it sit in the freezer for about 15 minutes or so, just to firm up real nice. Um, so that way trimming it is a lot easier. I, I've done that uh, not on the brisket so much because I don't usually have a lot of freezer space, but I have done that recently when making some of my jerky um, because it makes it much easier to slice and manage um, some, some of the small thin slices or whatnot you're dealing with um, and make sure that you have good control over the meat and not um, slicing things you don't want to slice. All right. Almost there for my rough trim. All right, so that's good enough for me. Some people will say I've been, oh my God, you, Rob, you've been way too aggressive. Um, but I think, actually, well, actually, I think I'm gonna take a little more hair off this edge, just because that's garbage. But for me, this is how I like, more or less, how I like my brisket. It's got some fat on there that's gonna render. Most of the fat since I had the muscle, that's why we've got the prime brisket. I'm gonna put seasoning on here and the seasoning will take for the most part. Um, some of this, I don't have spots where the fat is more than, you know, a quarter inch thick and stuff where you're just not gonna get the, get the seasoning to penetrate. Now, because I don't like to change my gloves 17 different times, I do like to prepare ahead of time. I have my container of my seasoning, my beef rub, and I just take it and drop it inside of a Ziploc bag um, and rubber band around it. That way you can take your hands up and handling the meat. You can handle the container and no big deal there. Um, I went ahead to my wife to pop my top. So lucky me, handling my meat, popping my top. Now that stuff's just gonna come right out. Woo, -hoo, yeah. So my beef rub, this is a, um, a rub I originally created for tri-tip competitions. Um, I used to use a different rub on my brisket, but then I tried it on my brisket one time, and we all said, well, goddamn. Uh, so this is a, a mix of uh, salt and garlic and pepper and uh, some seasoned, well, seasoned pepper and paprika and garlic. So uh, it's a nice liberal on there. Because what we're going to do is we're going to dry marinate this. So we're putting this seasoning on here. And then we're going to wrap this up, and we're going to put this in the fridge for at least 12 hours, and let these let the moisture in the meat pull in the seasoning into it. That's going to give us the flavors nice and deep in there, and then also going to help us when we want to make our nice bark later on. Um, now, this seasoning is a seasoning I make. It doesn't have as much pepper on it as. Um, I sometimes use because my it's kind of all purpose for my family and my, my son isn't a huge fan of black pepper um, but I do have a tendency when I do brisket to come back over this with a pepper grinder and hit it up a little bit extra pepper um, if I want a pep more peppery flavor so and then for uh, I mentioned woods I'm just gonna smoke this over uh, post oak um, that's, I, I'm a big believer that beef goes on oak. Oak has got a nice, um, flavor. It goes clean flavor with the, with, with the, um, brisket and the beef. It complements it. doesn't detract from it. Uh, when you're using stuff like hickory, which is sold a lot in the stores, hickory is not, in my opinion, a good meat for use with beef. It's such a strong flavor, it's gonna assert itself rather than let the beef talk for itself. 
So uh, I like to stick with oak for that reason. It's clean and isn't as over you, isn't as overly powerful. Um, mesquite, the mesquite can be a great wood for barbecue. It can be. The problem with it is that it's got a very narrow range in its cycle from being when it's green to when it's dry to where it produces good flavor uh, versus producing a lot of creosote flavor. So if you're using a stick burner uh, and you're buying um, mesquite, you just got to be cognizant of that. That's why I'm not a big fan of mesquite. Uh, I can't. I don't have the quality control on it, and I and I prefer oak. So pretty much I use oak. I might sometimes uh, throw in a little bit of pecan uh, so into it as well, but that's pretty much it. Just oak, maybe some bourbon barrel stuff, but that's just oak too. All right. So we're pretty much we've got our our rub on here. Make sure. Oops. Let's get some over here. Nice and liberal. You're gonna think, oh my God, all that salt, but you'll be surprised once it starts cooking and everything, it's not there. All right. There we are. Now, I'm gonna grab some butcher paper. I already have a piece cut off here. And I'm gonna go ahead and transfer my uh, brisket into the butcher paper. Now, pink butcher paper, you can nice stuff about this you can cook in it um, we often do part of more cooking if you have problems with it rolling like this if you were spreading out and want it to stay there spread out one of the tricks is you can fold this corner underneath the opposite and that'll help keep it from wanting to roll up butcher paper hacks um, as far as why Put it into the butcher paper instead of wrapping it in foil directly? I don't know. I, it's just something I do. I do. When I'm letting it sit there to dry married, I want it to be in the paper. The paper's more neut neutral versus the foil. Um, if for some reason something started to become acidic with the aluminum foil, you could start to get a chemical reaction uh, that you're not going to get with the paper. Uh, so I don't know that that's really a problem. It could be solely in my own head. But I'd rather be safe than sorry. Yeah. All right, there we are. And we're gonna go take this. I'm gonna go put this in the fridge, and we're gonna let it sit there and marinate. Until next time, we'll pull it uh, later on. We'll pull this out, and we'll go to the next step. Okay, so here we are, day two. I actually got the camera turned the correct way so you guys can fill your screen here. But our brisket has been going for 24 hours in a dry marinade. So we can go ahead and we're gonna open this up and we're gonna transfer it to an aluminum tray. First. So this so up here so we can take a look. And you can see this is just nice and just start soaking in all those that seasoning right into the meat. I'm gonna go ahead and put it into a tray. I'm gonna put it with the fat side up. And you can cook it on a rack, you can cook it in a tray. It's up to you. It's really a big decision. Is are you trying to get for a dry bark exterior? Um, if you are, you're gonna be cooking it on a rack, you're gonna do it open air, and you're never gonna wrap. If you're gonna, if you, if you plan on doing a wrap, a Texas Crutch, uh, to help get past the stall temperature, then what's gonna happen is that bark that you're gonna develop anyway is gonna kind of soften up and kind of go away anyway. So in this case, especially given how thin this is and to help keep my smoker clean, I'm gonna go ahead and keep it in the tray throughout the whole cook. This is gonna cook in here, it's still gonna get the smoke. The difference is it's gonna sit inside its own drippings, so it's gonna help it to self-baste. The other thing I'm gonna do is because this side is so thick compared down here, we have some of our fat discard, and we're gonna put some of that there. But first, 
what I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and take, like I mentioned before, I want to put a little bit more pepper on here. So I'm just going to take my pepper grinder, put some fresh ground pepper on it. And that's enough. Because I already have pepper and I don't want to put too much. I'm going to take some of this extra fat that I had and I'm just going to go ahead and put it here over my thin part. But what this is going to do is that as it starts to cook, that here is going to rent this, this fat is going to render down and help to keep this moist. And then part way through the cook, uh, I'm going to take that fat off then so that way the smoke can get underneath there. Because the thing this is going to do, well, I got my seasoning under there and it's going to keep this moist, is this is going to block the smoke from being able to absorb in this portion of the area as well. Um, so it's a but because it's so thin, I don't have as don't have to be doing it as exposed for as long as a period of time. So that's that. And we're gonna go ahead and let this sit here and start to come up to room temperature. Um, it's we're gonna put it on well before it gets room temperature, but I'm gonna let it sit for about 30 to 45 minutes while I go get the smoke. Alright, guys, we're back out here now in the backyard uh, with uh, one of my smokers. This is the uh, Camp Chef's pellet smoker that I use. Uh, and this is the one we'll be using tonight. I have a couple other uh, wood burners, but um, they're much larger for doing just one piece of meat. This is the perfect smoker for this type of cook for my family and for a lot of people because it, the capacity of this thing is going to be able to hold one brisket, no problem. Um, and it's set it and forget it, folks. It's like set, cook in your oven practically. We're going to set our temperature and go. Uh, it's so simple. Uh, now, the wood burners, they're not too much more difficult because I do have temperature controllers uh, that you can set up and configure and do stuff, but it's a much more complicated method. So for this, it's really straightforward. We're just gonna load up some pellets in the hopper. Um, I already have some in there because I was cooking some jerky the other day using the oak. So I just loaded up a bu bucket full of some more uh, oak wood pellets. I'm just going to fill that hopper pretty much to the top because I'm going to be cooking for a long time. Matter of fact, we'll probably have to add more pellets to it as we go, but that's fine. So uh, that's ready to go. I can flip it on. And then uh, once it's, it's got yeah, itself configured, all I got to do is set my temperature. So for this case, I'm going to go ahead and set it to 250 degrees. And fire it up now I want to open this top and basically I just got to sit here and wait for um, with it in the open position for some smoke to come out of it and then we'll close it up let it finish getting up the temperature and then we'll go grab our meat and get all right it on. so we're back the uh, smoker is up to temperature and we're ready to go ahead and get the brisket on there so first thing I want to talk about is a couple things one somebody might be asking what the hell is this this is an insulated blanket that goes over the smoker. So when we're doing these overnight cooks, uh, the smoker stays warmer, and this allows us to burn less fuel um, in order, and that's gonna be helpful, especially overnight if I wanna get some sleep, because uh, you'll notice it's dark out here. It's just about uh, 10 minutes to midnight. We're gonna put this on now at midnight. I'm, I'm guesstimating here on this 10 pound brisket um, that I'm going to need about a 14 hour cook on this. Uh, so that's going to take us to about 2 p.m. And then I want to take it, and that's to get to about a 195 degree temperature. And then I want to take it off and I want to put it into a thermal chamber and I want to let it rest for about two up to three hours minimum before I start to cut into it. So that means I can start to have dinner around 5 to 6 p.m. Uh, assuming everything goes well. But this also allows me some play time in case it's not going well, whether I have to turn the heat up or whether I need just more cook time in order to achieve the desired doneness. So it's you can always let, and this is the great thing about cooking a brisket, is if you have a warm place to put it, whether it's in the tray and you put it in the oven with the door closed and don't turn the heat on, or whether you put it into an ice chest with no ice, just close the lid. 
you can let it sit there and sit there and rest for hours. It's gonna stay piping hot when you get into it. And the reality is it's only gonna get better as it reabsorbs those juices and, and gets those flavors mingling. I like my brisket to have a longer rest time, but we'll get to that later. Um, so anyways, that's our plan on cooking. So in order to do this, so I don't have to keep babysitting all night, I'm also gonna go ahead and stick probes. Now, this particular smoker has a probe for itself for the meat, and I can come out here and take a look at it. I'd rather not do that. Instead, I'm gonna be using a wireless probe. A lot of wireless probes are Bluetooth based and are gonna be limited in your range. Uh, so I can only maybe just go inside my house and stay the closest I can to here, you know, 25, 30 feet, that's about it. Uh, this is a product called Meter that I use, um, and they make this one as the Meter Block. It has four probes, and each probe is like a stylus. It's completely wireless. It has in it some batteries. Uh, it's been no charging in here on the thing, and it ha will connect via Bluetooth to this base. This base connects via Wi-Fi to my internet, and now I can, from my phone, in my anywhere in my house, or for that matter, anywhere on the planet where I have internet connection, I can monitor my cook. So if I need to run to the store, I can monitor my cook. Go to the barber shop? Probably not, but I could monitor my cook. Anyways, so I'm gonna go ahead and grab one of these probes. I just grabbed probe four, so I'm paying attention to that. Move this off to the side. Grab my brisket. And I'm going to probe it. Now I'm going to probe it in the thick down here in the point. There, if I was doing this for a competition, I would do multi probes. I'd probe the flat and I'd probe the point, so that way I can know what's going on with these different thicknesses. But in this particular case, I'm not doing that for my home. I don't really need it. So go ahead and get that in there. Good. And I'm going to just because I know how these probes work. I'm going to point it this way so it's pointed at the, the transmitter is pointed at my uh, receiver and I'll be good to go. All right, let's open this up and we're just going to slide this brisket in in the back there. All there is to it, close our lid and now we're cooking. Uh, we'll go ahead and bring up the temperature on there and we'll let it smoke and we'll come check on this in a, probably uh, two to three hours. We'll take a look at it, maybe, maybe around four o'clock in the morning, pull that fat off, and then we'll let it cook some more. So good morning, guys. It's uh, six o'clock in the morning. Uh, it's been six hours uh, at 250 degrees, and this brisket's actually advanced faster than we expected. It's gone actually already through the stall temperature uh, and uh, is sitting at about 180 degrees right now. Uh, so back the temperature down some uh, because we can go ahead and draw this out a little bit more. But we're still going to go ahead and cover it up. So I'm going to open it up, pull my brisket out, and what you can see here is we have our brisket sitting nice. The bark's coming up real nice, and it's sitting in the pool. So that um, underneath the fat, you can see it's uh, it's moist here. It's being trapped underneath there. I'm going to go ahead and take that off um, and I'm going to go ahead now and cover this in foil. The only exception is to put a little hole for the probe to stick out. Alright, set so this back in there, close that back up, we've dropped the temperature down, we set it to 200, um, so that's really going to slow this down now at this point because uh, with the brisket at 180 getting and getting the internal temperature of 195, uh, 200 ambient temperature is going to take a really long time actually to get the rest of the way up there. Um, so for right now that's fine, I want to just slow this down, I just want to let it continue to sit there and do its thing for a bit and then uh we'll come check on it uh we'll around the probes but we'll probably come check on it a couple couple hours and then uh make a decision from there whether we want to go ahead and 
uh, turn it back up a little bit to finish it off, or whether we're going to go ahead and continue, let it do a slow uh, internal ride. Right, so it's just about 11 o'clock in the morning here. Uh, our brisket's been on for 11 hours. Um, it ended up cooking uh, a good portion of the way faster overnight. Um, and what we found, what I found out going back and looking at some of the data, one of the nice things, I get a nice chart that shows me my data. There was a couple of issues that happened that caused it to cook faster than anticipated. Uh, one was, is that apparently I have a temperature issue with this smoker. I had set it for 250 degrees, and normally when I set it to 250, my ant, since the temperature probe is down near the fire pot, my actual ambient temperature ends up being about 240. And so it's a little bit lower, and that's fine. Uh, but in this particular case, I set it at 250, and it ended up heating up and cooking at 275 degrees. So we we're at a much higher temperature uh, than I was expecting. Combine that with the fact that when I did my calculation about cook times, I actually was going off of my notes for cooking temperature at 225. So we had a 50 degree temperature difference, which is why the brisket cooked as fast as it did overnight. Um, I missed my alarm to wake me up in the morning. That happens, that's the joy of uh, overnight cooking sometimes, but we were fine. Um, we've, we had lowered the temperature down, and it's been cooking now since our last check-in here. At uh, well, while it's set here at 200, it's been hovering around 215 to 220 degrees. The internal temperature of the brisket right now is about 190 degrees. It's going to continue to go up on its own, and I like it to be roughly between 195 to 197. So ultimately, right now, it's time for us to go ahead and let it rest. Um, what I'm going to do, because uh, I want to bring it down slowly, uh, rather than put it in straight into a temperature chamber, I'm just going to go to my smoker here, and I'm going to lower the temperature to my cold smoke range. The cold smoke range is going to set the temperature to about 160 degrees. That's going to be lower than the temperature that I want uh, my brisket to ultimately heat, heat uh, be at. But it's going to be an advantage. It's going to keep the temperature in the safe range. For holding food it's going to keep bacteria from forming so we can go ahead and keep it at that range for a while we're not endangering of overcooking the brisket where it's actually going to continue to stay covered and uh, sit in its juices and allow those flavors to continue to mix throughout the meat but we're going to keep it at a safe hold temperature so we can serve it later so we'll just go ahead and set that cold smoke low smoke there and uh, we can actually take a quick gander at it. Let me grab this and bring this over here. Um, so here we are. The, uh, so we can see the brisket in there. It's got a nice pool of juices it's sitting in. It's got a nice bark on the top. Uh, this is just going to be a beautiful, I can feel it. It just the meat's already nice and nice and loose, so that's gonna be great. So let me go ahead and uh, button this back up here. And there we go. We're gonna go ahead and leave it, and I'm gonna let it get, go here on the low smoke, uh, probably for about another, till about two o'clock in this afternoon, at which point then I'm gonna go ahead and pull it off let it do its final rest before we get into cutting this. Pie. All right, so we're out here now. It's about uh, almost uh, two o'clock in the afternoon. It's about 1.30 in the afternoon. Our brisket has been on now for all, coming up on 14 hours. Uh, last time we had done, we had brought it down. Temperatures, the meat the temperature has, in terms of we started to come down uh, in our resting, which is what I want. It's down to about 176 internal temperature right now. So I'm going to go ahead and remove it from the heat source to make sure that we don't dry it out. Um, and we're going to go ahead and take it in to the kitchen and I'll put it into my oven uh, where it's going to rest. So <clears throat> I'm just grabbing a cookie sheet, make sure it's easy to uh, hold and handle because this uh, aluminum pan is soft. Um, not too hot because the internal temperature is only about 200 degrees and because you got his best as fingers. So here we go. I don't know why he's doing it for long because it does start to hurt. Alright, close that up. Oh, 
should use my hot handles because the tray goes over. And uh, we'll see you inside when it's time to cut into this. All right, so we're back. It's time to get this thing ready to go here. The brisket has been resting in the oven with no heat. Uh, so we're taking it out here and you can see, you can see all that fat that rendered out, that ju the juice is there in the pan. And uh, what we're left with, and this has been sitting there just soaking that up on the backside. Uh, so we're going to take that out, put that onto our cutting board. And this now is just going to go off to the side, not need it anymore. Okay, so you can already start to see this is already coming right. You can see where the uh, muscles here have started to come up are separate. Right here's our separation point between the muscles, and so we can go ahead and take that and start to separate out that muscle, just like that. And now we have our flat and our point. Let's go ahead and move this off the side because it's a little bit easier to see first. So I'm going to take my my uh, point here and remember the grain was going the opposite direction so I'm going to want to slice this way with my point and get in there and you're going to you can see the smoke ring in there on that beautiful piece of meat that smoke ring you can see it flop but it still holds together a little bit there so that's just going to be great we can take that, pull that right apart. Amazing. All right. So I'm going to slice this up. Don't really want much more than quarter inch slices. Again, you see it's, it's nice. When we separate, the nice thing about separating like this is these, the fatty, you can, your guests can choose whether or not they want from the fatty part or the leaner part. And the other advantage is that your slices here from the point aren't going to be super thick, but it's something that's manageable. So slide the point off to the side. Here's our flat. I like to bifurcate it because otherwise it's really long slices. This goes this way. So again, we're just going to slice. And get that in there. Real nice. That's it, guys. I hope you enjoy this as much as we're going to enjoy this. Because we're going to, we're all getting ready. Mouth, mouths are watering, ready to enjoy this. Um, you know, so this is uh, doing a brisket. Knock yourselves out, guys. Enjoy. Until next time, I'm just a fat man with fat stack comics and fat pieces of meat. And a fat opinion. Thanks for watching.